Hello and welcome back. Today I'd like to talk about the transfer register. Now this is the last register from the original design that I haven't built yet and it's going to make quite a big difference to the functionality of the processor build. Now if we have a look at the registers that we've got at the moment, on the left here we've got the 16-bit counter address registers. They're connected to two buses, the transfer bus and the address bus, both of which are 16 bits, so they can load from and assert to the transfer bus and they can assert to the address bus. On this side we have the main 8-bit bus and the registers that are on that. So at the bottom here we've got the constant register which is a, a special purpose register that loads from memory and can assert back to the main bus. And then we've got the four general purpose registers. Now they can both load from and assert to the main bus but they can also assert to the left hand side and right hand side buses which are used for the ALU inputs. Now the transfer register is going to sit across the bottom once it exists as a PCB and that connects to both the 16-bit and the 8-bit side. Let's look at what that means. So we've got these five main buses in the system. The main bus most things are connected to but the address registers are only connected to the transfer bus and the address bus. The GPRs are connected to the main bus and the ALU input buses. But we don't have anything that connects between the two. At the moment all I can do is increment and decrement addresses and clear them which we've only got hooked up to the reset line at the moment. So we really need to be able to do something a bit more complex than that. We're going to want to compute addresses, set the registers to different values, perform jump instructions, and that means we need to have something that connects the 8-bit side of the processor over here with the 16-bit address registers, and that's the transfer register. So that's going to sit across the bottom of the register stack and connect the two halves. The way that works is it's a 16-bit register and overall I'm going to be calling it TX but that's split into two halves TL and TH which are 8-bit registers. So over here the connection to the main bus our 8-bit instructions can talk about TL and TH and then over on the 16-bit side we can talk about TX. If you've dealt with something like an x86 processor you'll be familiar with this concept where you've got say the AX register is also AL and AH being the lower and higher halves of it. But I'm just going to be doing that with the one register here as a single bridge between the two sides of the processor as that simplifies the overall design quite a bit. But there is an interesting complexity about this. If we think about what operations that we can do with this. For TX, we're going to want to assert TX to the address bus, assert TX to the transfer bus, and load TX from the transfer bus. So that will allow us to copy one of the other 16-bit registers into TX, copy the value out from there, or use it directly as an address in a memory lookup. On the 8-bit side, we want to be able to do asserts and loads of both TL and TH. But that does mean that we've got something fundamentally new here but we haven't had in any of the other registers. If you look at the general purpose register up here, we've got a load from one location, and then we can assert back to multiple locations. On the address register, we can load from one location and assert back to multiple locations. But nowhere in any of these existing registers do we support loading from more than one bus. And that is unfortunately something that we're gonna to have to be able to do with the transfer register. So if you look at, say, this half, TL, it needs to be able to load from the main bus and it needs to be able to load from the lower eight bits of the transfer bus when we're loading TX. So we're going to need to talk a bit about how we can uh, implement that functionality. The current GPRs and the address registers are single input and multiple output registers, but what we want to build for the transfer register is a true dual ported register. While the transfer register has the upper and lower halves, TL and TH, 
the real problem that we've actually got to solve is creating a true dual port register. And once we've done that, we can double it up, add the extra glue logic, but most of that is fairly straightforward and, uh, and similar to the kind of problems we've already solved. So this is the one that we need to resolve. So let's start with the bit we do know. To drive a signal to two buses, we've done before. So if we imagine these green lines here to be the current value of the register, then we can use the 74LS541 line drivers in the same way as we did for the general purpose register to conditionally drive those values back to the left and the right buses that we've got here. So we just have two assert lines, one for the left-hand bus and one for the right-hand bus. In the case of the transfer register, that would be one half of the transfer bus or the main bus. But in this context, we're just generically talking about dual port registers. So we'll just call this left and right. Now let's think about what we would have done for the general purpose register. We have a single latch chip, and then we have a load line that will instruct it to load from the main bus. In this case, I've just wired it to the left-hand side and you know, this works. This worked for us on the GPRs, very similar principle worked for us on the address registers, but we've got no way of getting the data into the register from over here on the right. When I was first sat down working through all of the design of this processor, this was one of the bits that uh, I had to focus on for a while. And once I had solved it, I was kind of able to move on and finish off the rest of the processor design. The design I came up with for doing this isn't what I'm actually going to use, but I will talk you through it because I think it's quite clever and it's something that I certainly think I could see a use for on perhaps another build in the future. But an important thing to mention is the way the load signal works. This is what I was imagining. It's these 74LS574 latch chips, they load their data from the inputs on the rising edge. And I was kind of automatically thinking that a load signal would look like this. That is, we'd have a load line that was sat there at ground, would go up to the five volts when we wanted the load to happen, and then drop down at the end of the cycle. And the problem with this is it doesn't give us any warning. So if we were trying to make a decision about where that latch chip was going to load from, whether it was going to be the left-hand side or the right-hand side or whatever we wanted to call the two buses, we had no time to do it in. So I could come up with like an alternate signal that would kind of preempt where the load was going to happen from, but that's kind of adding extra circuitry to the bus control, which I didn't want to do. So I came up with this system. What we do is we have two latch chips, one that on command will load from the left-hand bus and one that on command will load from the right-hand bus, but they both output into the same set of lines but we control them via the output enables. What I came up with is we add a set reset latch and then we wire it up like this. So let's try and describe what's going on here. If we're loading from the left-hand bus, we trigger a load here. That grabs this uh, data from the left-hand bus into this latch, but we're also setting the set reset latch, which means this one is the one that's going to be outputting to the main lines here. We'll see it in the LEDs, and that's what either one of these line drivers will push onto the bus if we ask the overall register to assert. But over here, we trigger this load. This one gets loaded, but the set reset latch switches over and is now asserting this one and not this one into what has now become like a, an internal current value bus. Now the awesome thing about this is that we don't need any warning about where the load is coming from. We don't need any extra signals. The loads can work like everything else. But then as I progressed the rest of the build further forward, I kept coming across this odd thing that signals like this weren't very common. Actually, because of the way the demultiplexer chips work, it was going to be far easier to have a load signal that looked like this. So it would actually sit there high. The load still happens on the rising edge, but it sits there high, drops low when we select that register for a load, and then returns to high at the appropriate point. The increment on the counter chips work like this, and the demultiplexer chips seemed particularly well tuned for producing this kind of signal. And when I've looked at other devices and other chips and other circuits, they seem to have signals that work like this. 
you know, it kind of seemed odd, but I knew I could work with it. But it was only when I came back and started looking at this particular problem again that I realized what I suspect is at least one of the reasons why signals work like this. And that's, this is giving us warning. This line going low is telling us that the rising edge is gonna come from this line. And so we can make use of that. So we go back to having a single latch chip but then what we can do is use a set of two to one multiplexers on the input to basically connect both buses at the same time. And then we just need an input select, which is going to tell us which of these buses to be directing out these sets of lines. And therefore that the, the latch chip is going to load when it receives the load signal. So here's the load signal wiring. Now the two load lines, we've anded those together to create the load line on the latch. So if either one of those goes low, the load line here will go low, and then when it returns to high, this latch chip will load. But in this case, if the left-hand load line goes low, we're not changing anything on the multiplexer input, so it will be taking the first set of inputs, which are from the left-hand bus. But if the right-hand input goes low, we're changing the input select on the multiplexer, and so it will switch all of its inputs to directing this set of lines from the right-hand bus to the output, and that's the data that will be loaded by the latch. So we've solved the same problem, but actually if we take the circuit for this and put it together with the other circuit, we've actually used slightly less gates. And so this is the circuit that I'm, I'm going to use to implement the transfer register over the next few build videos. Now solving this problem of implementing a dual port register was one that I found particularly interesting when I was putting together the design for this processor. I can see a lot of uses for this in more complicated builds going forward. This is the main design elements covered, so hopefully when I start plugging wires into the breadboards over the next few videos, you'll be able to reference this and make a bit of sense. I'm keen to get on with that, so uh, thanks for watching the design video. Goodbye.